Hey, welcome to the channel. We hope that you enjoy today's stories and check out the chapters on the video to see all the stories for today. But before we get into this video, subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to get notified when we release a new video. So let's get into the video. People who have spent time in a psych ward, what is the craziest thing you've witnessed? Story 1. My mother worked in an asylum in Ireland when she was about 15. This was in the early 60s. She loved working there, despite the fact that some of the patients would physically try and end her. One patient always stuck out to her, every day he would tell my mom he was going to end her when she finished work. She knew he loved music, so would tell him she was out dancing that night, and could he wait until the next day, which he agreed to. The next day he would forget what he had said and would threaten her again, and she'd say the same thing again. This went on for a couple of years that she worked there. Story 2 I was in an adolescent inpatient facility for 30 days. Two people come to mind. One kid named David was very tall for his age, I think he was only 13. He insisted on watching Friday the 13th movies on movie nights and everyone was afraid to disagree with him because of his violent nature and frequent homicidal fantasies. He hated taking his meds and probably two or three times a week he'd brawl with the psych nurses over it. No joke, it took five to six large grown men to overcome this kid. He was scary. The other one was just sad, a girl named Wendy. She was 13 and really nice. But she always wore the same clothes and she stank really, really bad. Apparently, this is a common defense for kids who have been repeatedly forced intercourse by family. They don't clean themselves or they'll even soil themselves to make themselves undesirable to their abuser. I gave her a big hug every night in the common area when it was time to go to our cells. There were several really questionable things in this place. Another example was school. It was two or three days the week. In that room, there was almost nothing educational or appropriate for people my age, 13. I remember reading a book about spontaneous human combustion in that room. It even had pictures of burnt corpses in it. Another thing that might just be a sign of the times is you could work your way up to getting cigarette breaks with the staff through good behavior. These were kids aged 13 to 17. Smoking with the therapists. This was in 1990. Story 3. Not a patient, but an employee. Had a 16-year-old kid come in who was about 6 feet 2 inches and 220 pounds. Built like a linebacker. I found out that since he was technically a child, he somehow ended up at an autism school for children with very little security. He ended up inflicting a TBI on one of the teachers and got sent to us. The kid had a violent streak the likes I hadn't seen before, he knew he was stronger than most and liked to fight unprovoked and it always took four to six people to restrain him. I have never seen a patient spend more time than him in the safety room, an incredibly small padded room with nothing in it. His parents wouldn't authorize his move somewhere else and they wouldn't take him home either. We were not equipped for someone with his level of violence. So, there he Saturday. For one and a half years. It wasn't like a single incident that was crazy, it was the entire situation. Story 4 I've worked in one for about two years now. The staff are just as crazy. Here are some highlights. The patient got into the ceiling and couldn't get them down for a while. Patient milked himself into their coffee. Did you know some antipsychotics make you lactate? The entire adolescent unit escaped because maintenance forgot to lock the gate. Don't worry, they all came back eventually. And myself getting a concussion from a patient trying to escape, they weren't successful, but at least I didn't work for six weeks. Story 5 I was a social worker at an institution that had a hall for what we called lifers. It was essential for people who had no hopes of ever being released due to their conditions. Anyway, my hall had 14 beds and it was full. There was this one guy who was huge. He was 6 feet 7 inches and about 350. His name was Simon. He suffered from drug-induced schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He talked to himself all day, but never talked to others. 
All the other men in the ward were scared of him. It was my day to do the first shift. I got there early to start on some paperwork I needed to finish. When I got my keys in the door, I heard Simon hit the door with his fists. I looked through the tiny window on the door and he and the hall were covered in blood. I panicked and called security for backup because I thought he had killed somebody. Turns out, Simon was in the throes of an extreme manic episode and had managed to walk the literal saws of his feet off. Other medication he was on thinned his blood and led to him bleeding all over the place. We checked the camera footage and he had walked and talked all night. The orderly, who was fired that day, had slept through his whole shift and never heard Simon walking back and forth. Story 6 1. A woman I shared a room with demanded to be discharged. It was a voluntary admission, so her doctor discharged her on condition that someone else pick her up and take responsibility for her. Her ex-husband came and signed the discharge paperwork. Then they handed him all of her medications. He proceeded to give her the meds to pack in her bag and left the room while she was packing. No one else was in the room with her at the time and she proceeded to drink most of the pills she had. A nurse found her drinking the pills and got the other nurses to help restrain her while they waited for the paramedics. The paramedics loaded her up and took her to the government hospital. I hope she's okay and doing better now. 2. There was a guy who was completely narcissistic and managed to piss off all of the other patients by insisting that people who have attempted self-deletion are weak and should just get on with it. He was also delusional. Insisting that he was the CEO of a big company and better than everyone else. After that, everyone shunned him. 3. Many years ago, I was a student nurse and had one patient that had frequent psychotic episodes with times of lucidity in between. During one of his psychotic episodes, he managed to rip out his foreline and his catheter and then threw his glass water carafe on the floor. Everything was sopping wet and there were glass shards all over the floor. I did manage to get him to sit in a chair while I cleaned up the floor and remade his bed with dry bedding. Then I tried to dress him in dry PJs. It was at that moment that a whole platoon of medical students came into the room with their professor to see another patient. This guy then decided that I was the sexiest thing alive and tried to kiss me wherever he could while I was trying to dress him. Instead of helping, the medical students just laughed their butts off. Eventually, we had to restrain this guy because he was still in the midst of his psychotic episode. The next day I had to help the same guy wash up, but this time he was lucid. I'll never forget him apologizing for the previous day. I'll never forget what he said next. I'm not nuts. I'm a fruitcake really. And the first thing I thought was, dude, you're a nutty fruitcake. I didn't say it out loud though. Story 7 a girl grabbed my toe while I was sleeping. I woke up and said, What the heck? And she ran off. I went to the front desk to complain, and while I'm talking to the lady, the girl jumped on my back and clung like a monkey while screaming. It was bizarre. I threw her off me, and the lady just said, Sorry about that, lol. Story 8. Not super crazy. Just. Odd was with a bunch of teens in a pediatric ward, but we all had special rooms by the nurse's desk with shatterproof, wired glass so the nurses could always look in on us easily, and the bathrooms had no locks. Myself and another girl were in for anorexia. Another guy had self-deletion tendencies to the point where he couldn't have any cutlery but a plastic spoon for meals, no blankets, special pajamas, etc. And then there was a young homeless guy who'd been hit by a car while squeegee ing for change, so his leg was in a full cast, yet he still had a habit of sneaking around in his wheelchair and hoarding extra supplies from the kitchen, the kids' playroom, the nurse's station, etc., so they kept him in one of the psych rooms. We formed a weird little club and would often play cards in a lounge area together. Conversations would go something like this. Me. Hey, does anyone want this cheese? I snuck it into my pocket so nurse thought I ate it. Homeless kid. Mine. Dibs. Here, you can have these beads I swiped from craft time. Other anorexic. 
I'll get you some ice cream and saltines if you find me some sewing gear. I'm going to sew some batteries into my hair scrunchie for my next weigh-in day. Self-deletion kid. Do you think I'd die if could scoop my eyeball out with a spoon? And so on. It was a very bizarre time in my life. I got out and had an absolutely crazy life up until this point. The self-deletion guy was still alive when I was released after three months, but I'm not sure what happened to him. He was too depressed to continue playing cards with us after a while, so I hope he ended up okay. Other anorexic girl got out and actually had success as an actress in a sitcom and a movie. The batteries did fall out of her hair scrunchie during weigh-in and she ended up grounded and locked in her room for a week. The homeless guy and I actually had a little mini romance while in the ward, and when he was released, he sliced a belt loop off of his jeans and gave it to me to remember him by. I still have it, nearly 30 years later. Story 9 Guy had a tattoo carved into his neck. Apparently, he took a pen in his fist and repeatedly carved it into the skin right on his neck. It looked very scratchy and was still red despite it apparently being pretty old. You know how really young kids grip a crayon in their fist and grind it against the paper really hard? If you made a fist with your left hand and put it below the left ear, that was exactly how he must have done it. Story 10 The funniest thing I ever saw, spent a total of about three years in my teens and early 20s a kid in seclusion who was having a genuinely good time making staff's life a living nightmare while he was in there took apart the plastic mattress, tore the foam inside into small pieces, donned the empty mattress, and started yelling. I'm gonna be damn it! While tossing the pieces of foam around like confetti. Even most of the staff were laughing about it. If you're enjoying today's video about stories of our lives, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this and more. Now, let's get back to the video. Story 11 Worked in involuntary psych for five years as a technician. You see a lot, some funny and lighthearted, some very gross, and a lot tragic. Had an older gentleman that looked and dressed like a member of the Rat Pack. He was a lifer and pretty calm when he was on his meds. His thing was he had no control over his speech center and would just stream of consciousness all day to whoever was near. He would say something like, I used to work down at the mill and my landlady Grace loved coffee or I would be in trouble with my uncle. That was him asking you for a cup of coffee to drink. I miss him, very sweet man when he wasn't yelling at you. Sometimes patients would come in that had been around a few times and knew the system. They won't force you to take meds in jail, so these guys would act out violently to get to jail where they wouldn't be forced to take meds. I responded to a call for staff. I was in the nurse's station doing paperwork and I burst out of the door and headed towards the day room at a flat run. The dude heard me coming and waited in ambush at a 90 degree corner right at the end of the hall. He had picked up one of the light plastic chairs we had and swung it at me like a bat. I managed to get my arms up to block, but he stepped into the swing and used the chair like a lever, throwing me 15 feet back down the hallway. I weigh about 150 pounds. I managed to get away with a small bruise on my arm and butt. The patient got what he wanted and was sent to jail. A place I worked had these conjoined courtyards that were shared by two units at a time. A tick from each unit was assigned to monitor the yard, and we would usually sit on a bench where we could see everything and just chat during yard time. So, this patient from the other ward came over to sit with us and smelled gross. He had paranoid delusions, real tinfoil hat stuff. I said to him, Hey, do you know the one place where the government can't watch you? The shower. To my amazement, it worked. He happily went to his unit to take a shower. Q10 minutes later this guy comes running out of his ward and into the courtyard, but naked and soapy, being chased by two other techs. I felt a little responsible for this, so I joined in the chase. He ran around the courtyard a few times before we chased him back into his unit and to his room. He jumped up on the bed and looked at us. Since it wasn't my patient, I let the other two techs take lead. The guy fainted left, then lunged right to try to jump on his roommate's bed. 
The two techs lunged after him and managed to get a hold of his sweaty arms. Did I mention he was so slick and sweaty that he had already literally slipped out of our hands a few times, and the whole group of them tripped their way onto this second bed together. The patient got turned face down and landed on the bed. One of the unfortunate techs slipped on the tile floor and landed nose into the patient's butt cheeks. I'll never forget that. Story 12 Saw a 90 pounds, 5 foot girl toss one of those 18 L water cooler bottles, a full one at that, at a bunch of nurses trying to calm her down as she was having a manic episode it took a few security guards and quite a few nurses to take her down. I'd just been talking to her the previous evening and she was an absolute sweetheart who gave me a book as a going away gift as I was being discharged the next day. I still own that book and I still think about her and wonder from time to time what she's up to do were briefly in contact, but she dropped off the face of the earth. A close second would be the time for my second stay in another psych unit in 2021 where a guy was going through alcohol withdrawals and screaming about a bear coming into his room and they had to lock him into his room and keep him heavily sedated. When he was allowed to mingle with people, he was still relatively sedated, so confused and lost and kept asking me and other people if we knew what happened to the bear. Pretty sure he was an absolute hardcore alcoholic that had fried his brain and I felt pretty bad for him. Story 13. Not a psych ward, but an inmate at a jail I spent some time as a trustee at who was very mentally ill. Dude had apparently been arrested after being drunk for the better part of the last month straight and was withdrawing hard as well as obviously not being all there mentally. He was in his own isolation cell, and everyone had heard him screaming all sorts of perverse, insane, and nonsensical crap since he was put in there. A while after dark, we got called over to do a cleanup of his cell, and what I saw in there was like something out of a horror movie. Blood on every surface, as well as just about every other bodily fluid one can imagine, as well as poop. Even on the freaking ceiling, and that must have been a feat to accomplish. Parts of his scalp had been pulled off and stepped to the mirror over the sink, which contained a mixture of the aforementioned bodily fluids and was no longer draining as a result. To top it off, he had pulled out many of his own teeth, which were scattered just about everywhere. I didn't vomit, but I certainly would have if I had stayed around. I just noped out and told them to get someone else to handle that. Easily one of the most disturbing things I've ever witnessed in person, and really showed me a different side of mental illness I'm not sure I'm glad to know exists. Story 14 This is maybe a little different than what you're expecting, but the most shocking thing to me was how the system in the U.S. is so scarily easy to fall into and get stuck in. My mom is bipolar and also has a narcissistic personality disorder, so growing up she was extremely controlling of me. Saw me as an extension of herself, basically. She didn't like it when I went away to college and had cut all ties with her. I was naive and finally told her that since I was self-funding my education and was an adult, there was nothing she could do to control me anymore. Boy, was I wrong. Hours after I asserted my independence, police knocked on my door. They politely informed me that my very concerned mother had requested a wellness check, reported that I was at risk of harming myself and that they were required to arrest me. I was cuffed and put into a cop car right then and there, and they took me to the local emergency room for evaluation. This emergency room had a separate psychiatric section, and I was locked into a padded room with literally nothing. No phone, no bed, just an empty white padded room. I was left alone there for 13 full hours with no food, and no one came to check on me. I'd had to use the bathroom and eventually couldn't hold it anymore. I was about to leave for work right when the cops came and weren't able to call in, so I was worried about what was happening with my job. I was extremely stressed out by the time the doctor came to assess me. She didn't ask what was going on, only said that they were going to admit me and asked if I'd go voluntarily or involuntarily. Explained that voluntarily meant three days. I started to try to explain what happened. She said that she'd held me involuntarily then and just left. A nurse did eventually bring me food, water, and a gown, but it was another several hours stuck in that room alone. Eventually, they transferred me to an inpatient center. 
They loaded me up in a transport ambulance, strapped me to the bed, and off we went on a five-hour drive to that facility. The ambulance guys were the first ones that actually listened to me after the whole mess started. They released my hands and even let me smoke cigarettes in the back with them. The nurses during intake at the inpatient place were so kind. They listened to my story of what happened, seemed to believe me, and allowed me to make just one phone call with their cell phone, otherwise I wasn't allowed to call anyone. I called my aunt to tell her what happened and begged for help. Seconds later, I encountered my first other patient who jumped on me, knocked me to the ground, and shoved his hand down my pants. The nurses and staff were incredibly nice. They gave me a lot of advice, they actually suggested I pretend to be anorexic, which wasn't hard since I was extremely skinny, and their food was awful, so that I could have some disorder to treat and show progress on. Unfortunately for me, the head doctor was on vacation so I wasn't seen or evaluated. I spent two weeks there. My family, minus my mom, called and visited every day, driving four to five hours each way. They explained what happened and what my mom was like, but since the attending doctor was on vacation, I wasn't allowed to be released. Eventually, my family hired lawyers and threatened to sue the place, and I was finally let go. It was the most terrifying and frustrating experience I've ever had. It still haunts me to this day. It made me realize my freedom is just an illusion, and at any moment I can be locked up and held against my will with no rights or way out. I also didn't have health insurance at the time, so the bill was insane. Took me 15 years to pay off and just finished a couple of years ago. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed today's video, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel to see more videos about stories of our lives. Click on one of these videos to watch more and see you soon.